Welcome back, Spare Parts Army. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Caffey. There are 28,500 US troops stationed in South Korea, and every single March, like clockwork, they conduct an annual training exercise. You need only enter a few quick searches to see the kind of response that North Korea has to these drills. They respond with diplomatic warnings, denouncings, and even nuclear threats. It's one of North Korea's main gripes. It's like the popular saying goes, one man's boring training exercise is another man's geopolitical crisis. So why does something that appears to be such a routine defensive action from the point of view of the United States elicit such a strong response from North Korea? I also want to explore the reasons why these drills exist in the first place, and the future of one of the world's longest standing wars. But first, a quick message from today's sponsor. This Military Appreciation Month, Navy Federal Credit Union is celebrating active duty service members, veterans, and their families. For more than 90 years, Navy Federal has made it their mission to support the military community. The military community goes above and beyond every day, and Navy Federal is committed to helping them reach their financial goals. Not only do they employ military family members and veterans, but they provide tools that can help you achieve financial success at every stage of your military status. And since they're a not-for-profit financial institution and member-owned, they're able to offer great rates, like a savings rate nearly two times the industry average, low fees and exclusive member discounts. Members could earn and save up to $473 per year, Navy Federal takes it the extra mile too and has stateside member reps available 24 seven online, over the phone, or even in person at a branch so you know they'll always have your back. Visit navyfederal.org slash celebrate to see all our Military Appreciation Month offers and other Navy Federal offers. At Navy Federal, the members are the mission. Navy Federal is federally insured by NCUA. What if I told you that despite the official ceasefire agreements, a low-level conflict has been brewing in the background this entire time? Violent skirmishes along the border in the air, on land, and sea have continued at a steady pace, but we rarely hear about it. On July 27, 1953, President Eisenhower signed an armistice on the Korean Peninsula. This split the country into the North and South along the 38th parallel. This armistice essentially hit the pause button on the war, and the border that divides the country into the two halves is known as the Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ. While major military campaigns between both sides stopped after the signing of the ceasefire, almost immediately afterwards, low-level fighting began along this 250-kilometer-long dividing line. Patrols along the DMZ regularly ambushed one another. American aircraft that approached the DMZ were shot at and sometimes downed with their pilots captured and held for ransom. To the people of Yongpyeong Island, who watched from their barbed wire shores in January of 2024, as North Korean artillery pounded the water in between their tiny island and the mainland, the conflict is anything but over. These citizens of South Korea can still remember when those shells landed on their homes and stores in 2010, destroying their businesses and killing their neighbors. This perpetual threat is what originally was used as justification, and it's what originally drove annual joint training exercises between the United States and the Republic of Korea in the first place, starting in 1955. That was just two years after the ceasefire and they've continued in one form or another all the way to this day. So in the 1950s, US troop numbers in Korea stood at around 75,300 soldiers, a major decrease though from the over 320,000 troops that were stationed there at the signing of the ceasefire. At the operational level, initially the annual exercises sought to strengthen the coordination between the United States and the South Korean ROK military leadership. At the tactical level, they work to strengthen the counterinsurgency capability of the Korean forces. Okay, so that kind of gives me an idea of why the US, from their point of view, why they run these training exercises, but why does North Korea dislike these training exercises so much from their perspective? David G, writing for The Diplomat in an article titled Why North Korea is so freaked out by US ROK drills, states that there are two main reasons why North Korea dislikes them. Reason number one is because the training exercises showcase the more advanced, technologically sophisticated weaponry of the United States and South Korean military, which reveals a stark contrast to much of North Korea's obsolete conventional equipment. Reason number two is allegedly because of economic reasons. According to David G, it puts economic pressure on North Korea who has to divert resources to increase defense on their border 
in response to the United States training exercises. North Korea claims that this forces them to carry out their own military exercises in response. This means they have to activate what's called their Red Guard Force, which is kind of like the reserves of other countries. So the claim here is that North Korea has to mobilize many workers who would otherwise be out planting crops for that year during March, when the exercises are always held. On the other hand, opponents would state that North Korea is using benign U.S. military defensive joint training as an opportunity to blame their country's food insecurity on the United States. David G argues that the training events led to North Korea responding with their own best capabilities, which are non-conventional. So we see missile launches and nuclear threats, all of which has now become so commonplace that it wouldn't feel like a regular Tuesday if there weren't threats coming from this region at least twice a year in our news cycle. If the US stopped running training exercises and North Korea stopped making threats for a year, I'd have to call a wellness check on them. But on the operational level, there's another reason why these joint drills are so valuable. Korea sits in one of the world's most geostrategically important positions because their proximity to China gives the United States close access to ports, airfields, and bases just a few miles away from their mainland. Military bases in Okinawa, Japan, and Korea create a ring of containment on the border of the East China and Yellow Sea. In the event of a crisis or conflict, it's a lot cheaper, faster, and easier to mobilize forces where there are already established bases and solidified human relationships, which can be gained through annual training exercises. But was North Korea ever seriously planning on an invasion that would test these exercises that the US and South Korea say are defensive in nature? Or was there a different threat driving the need for readiness at the DMZ? According to this 1969 CIA report titled Confrontation in Korea, they estimated that the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea had no intention of a costly full-on military invasion of the South, but would instead continue to try to establish guerrilla bases in South Korea to launch violent attacks. Throughout the Korean War, the Soviet Union remained one of the North's largest supporters. The Soviet Union helped to support communist revolutions through guerrilla warfare in places like Korea, Vietnam, Angolia, and Nicaragua. After the Korean War came to a stalemate, the Kim officials used this very same practice of irregular warfare instead of full-blown war. As North Korea sent small groups of infiltrators into the South, and attempts to establish a base for popular revolution. Because after the ceasefire, until 1965, both sides took time to rearm and retrain their forces. Then, five years later in 1970, something happened that a lot of people have no idea even occurred, but some historians call it the Second Korean War. During this period, there were renewed attempts by North Korean forces to infiltrate and cause chaos behind enemy lines. The result was over 1,000 South Korean soldiers KIA, 75 Americans killed, and 111 wounded. To remain sharp in response to the constant firefights and clashes, U.S. and South Korean forces participated in new joint annual training exercises. While these training exercises were going on, there were also constant clashes between the North and South. Unit 124 was North Korea's largest covert attempt to foment communist revolution down South. The group consisted of the most elite warriors and most devout commies that the regime could produce. In January of 1968, Unit 124 took on an ambitious mission. They literally attempted to cross the border and assassinate the president of South Korea inside the presidential palace known as the Blue House. A team of 31 North Korean commandos cut through the fence and snuck into the South but almost immediately on their second day they were spotted by four South Korean brothers who were innocently searching for firewood. The Unit 124 troops decided instead of killing them, they would attempt to indoctrinate them with the benefits of communism to ensure they wouldn't alert authorities of their presence. It didn't work. As soon as they could, the brothers alerted police of the infiltration, which sent the 25th South Korean Infantry Division hunting for them. The 31-man North Korean elite forces entered Seoul, where they were made preparations for their final attack at a temple about a thousand meters from the Blue House Presidential Palace. They switched into South Korean uniforms as disguises. They even made it within a hundred meters of the palace before the local police chief noticed something was out of place and started asking them questions. This turned into a firefight that killed 26 South Korean soldiers, four Americans, and wounded 66 more. Only two members of the North Korean team were captured alive, the rest were KIA. 
at this time, South Korean forces were conducting their own guerrilla operations in the north. So I think the emphasis on the tactical level counterinsurgency training during this time was a product of the environment fostered by the Cold War. They were meant to train on preventing the greatest threat to South Korea at the time, which was infiltration by North Korean special forces. I think one of the best examples of the type of capabilities that the United States and South Korean training exercises give them comes from their response to an incident called the 1976 Axe Murders. A team of American and ROK engineers were sent to trim a tree that was obstructing their view along the DMZ. The tree sat in what is essentially no man's land between the two sides of the border. When North Korean DPRK soldiers saw what the South Korean working party was doing, they set out in force to confront them. When the US and ROK forces refused to stop trimming the tree, North Korean soldiers attacked them, using one of their axes, killing two American service members. In response to this attack, President Johnson authorized Operation Paul Bunyan. It involved a US infantry company backed up by seven Cobra attack helicopters circling behind them. Then B-52 bombers from Guam flew overhead, escorted by US Phantom fighters. The aircraft carrier USS Midway and its task force were visible just offshore. According to a report of the incident from analysts who were monitoring North Korea's tactical radio net, the accumulation of combined arms forces had the effect of, quote, blowing their minds. The US and ROK engineers left only a stump of the tree as a reminder of what they're capable of. This show of force and the ability to layer capabilities is what these training exercises are all about. This capability only comes at the power of cooperation across multiple allies that each bring something valuable to the table. Take a look at these. These are four massive tunnel systems that were uncovered by ROK forces in 1974, 75, 78, and 1990, used to smuggle infiltrators and guerrilla units from North Korea into the South. During this time, the number of US troops stationed there fluctuated between 50,000 to 60,000. Despite having fewer troops, according to information gathered by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, joint US and ROK exercises were upgraded. Counterblow and Strong Shield, the name of those exercises, were replaced by what was called Focus Lens in 1968. This new exercise included upgraded wargaming and military simulations. While the US stepped up its exercises on the peninsula, American presidents began looking for a way to reduce the number of troops stationed there. This letter from President Nixon stated the intention to withdraw 20,000 US troops stationed in Korea. While the overall number shrank, Nixon did not end up following through on all 20,000. In 1977, President Jimmy Carter attempted to withdraw all US forces from Korea. The US military was in a state of drawdown after Vietnam, and Carter saw the troops stationed in Korea as both an unnecessary cost and a dangerous tripwire to force the US into war if North Korea attacked. Ultimately, Carter was convinced to keep US troops stationed on the peninsula, partly because Russia and China were not open to discussing security guarantees upon a US withdrawal. And this leads us to the final threat from North Korea that the joint exercise is trained to protect against. In 1991, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, a lot of the drive to wage guerrilla warfare simmered down. But without the Soviet Union, North Korea felt vulnerable. From this insecurity came a strategic shift from a priority of reunification to that of regime survival. This is when the North Korean nation first began racing towards developing a nuclear weapon. After the 1990s, the United States also took a softer approach towards its adversaries. During this time, US troops in Korea were reduced down to around 35,000. In 1991, the United States went ahead and removed all of their nuclear weapons from South Korea. Then in 1994, Bill Clinton actually suspended the joint annual exercise Team Spirit as a token of goodwill for North Korea, allowing international nuclear inspectors into their facilities. Things were chilling out along the border. But then I think you could argue that the global war on terror threw a wrench into all of this geopolitical peace because the US invaded Iraq and toppled their government. And how that did or did not affect North Korea is up for debate, but what we do know for sure is that it was in 2005 that Kim Jong-il announced that he had developed a nuclear weapon. On the other hand, as North Korea's nuclear weapons developed, this became an immediate priority from the United States and ROK joint security measures point of view. So what we saw was the training exercises now took on a stronger focus on air and rocket defense. 
so that the South Korean ROK could be more prepared to defend itself against a possible nuclear strike. South Korea has begun installing the first part of its advanced indigenous surface-to-air missile system. So one of the big questions here is whether these joint exercises are defensive in nature, like the US and South Korea claim, or if they're a pretense for an invasion of North Korea, like how they claim. If South Korean ROK troops were preparing for an invasion of the North, Infantry units would be focused on mountain warfare and subterranean warfare to prepare for the many underground bunkers inside North Korea. Underground warfare is something that the ROK and US troops train on, but it isn't the main priority of these exercises. If the United States was really planning on invading the North, you might think they would have a lot more mass and quantity there, but you might be surprised to learn there's only 50 American tanks, 90 combat planes, and 40 attack helicopters stationed in South Korea by the American forces. But what we do see is a lot of Patriot missile launchers, 60 of them, which is a defensive system to counter that missile threat from North Korea. So by looking at what the focus is at these training exercises, we can see they're not designed for offensive action. It's unfortunate to see this part of the world torn apart and dealing with the aftermath of a long line of decisions, which at this point were not really made by the leaders of either nation today, but by the generations before then. If you like these kind of reports where I give you different perspectives and theories, please hit the like and subscribe button to support these kind of reports. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Thank you for watching. Grab one of our new Cleanup Crew t-shirts from the link in the description and follow me on Instagram at CappyArmy.